Wonder Woman. The hero that convinced us that the DCEU could actually work for exactly 167 days. Did I love it? Yeah, it was great. Third Act had its problems, I made a few videos about it, but overall, solid flick with a main character that really worked and resonated with a lot of people. So, when it was announced that they'd make another one of these, and it would star Pedro Pascal, the actor that I fan cast in everything. Like, he should have been the lead in Jungle Cruise, but that's beyond the point. And he would be playing skeevy 80s guy Maxwell Lord. I was on board. Wasn't quite sure about Kristen Wiig as Cheetah, but hey, it's different. And what can go wrong if your movie has a human-cat CGI hybrid? One that actually also breaks every human law. And listen, was Wonder Woman 1984 as good as the original? No. Was it the worst thing to happen in 2020? No, that was Artemis Fowl. But man, Wonder Woman 1984 was kind of a mess. And it took me a while, honestly. I took some time, but I wanted to come up with a rewrite that was good because I wanted to do justice to this character. And I think there's some story beats here that could work. So I want to present my rewrite, the entire thing in one video. First things first. Patty Jenkins is an incredibly talented writer, director, I'm not trying to put her down with any of this. This is just a fun exercise. And apparently, someone else worked on this movie and wrote it, but allegedly, he sucks. So we're not going to talk about him. But Wonder Woman 1984. My issues with the movie, big picture, boil down to two plot points. Steve Trevor and the Dreamstone. Quick one on Steve Trevor, it is way too early to bring him back. This felt like a third movie beat. Give us some time to deal with his death, and more importantly, give Diana some time to figure out who she is without him. I liked Chris Pine a lot in Wonder Woman 1, and that's exactly why I do not want him in this movie. It's a real emotional sacrifice that Diana needs to reckon with. Also, Steve is a guy she knew for a few weeks, so maybe after 60 years it is a little weird that she hasn't moved on yet, but wishes. Wishing movies are usually a pretty straightforward animal, but it all depends on what the wishes in your wishing movie are supposed to represent. What are the wishes going to reveal about our characters? And Wonder Woman 1984 has no idea what the wishes are for. Diana wants a nice guy who died young to not be dead. Barbara wants to be stronger because she keeps getting harassed. Those are both quite reasonable wishes, that they're forced to give those wishes up. Why? Because they aren't the truth? In a wish story, if you renounce your wish, it's usually because the wish itself is bad. The movie is making the case that you actually didn't want that thing, like Labyrinth, or Fantasy Island, or Click. Some characters in the movie also make wishes that aren't selfish or anything like that. The secretary just wants help at work. That one guy just wanted a zoo. So now those are monkey's paw wishes. The guy gets animals, but he can't do anything with them. Shame on him for wanting a zoo, because that isn't the truth. And everyone else wants selfish or downright evil things. More power, war, walls, deportations, death. And that really bugged me. The world presented in Wonder Woman 1984 is an incredibly pessimistic one. If given the chance, almost everybody would wish for something terrible. And that terrible wish would destroy the world. No one would wish for world peace or the cure for cancer or to just make anything better. The wishes at the end of the movie need to be renounced. Not because any wishes made on the Dreamstone are inherently evil, but because the wishes the citizens of the world choose to make are bad. And they need to renounce their wish because the truth is beautiful. Diana only renounces her wish because her superpowers are fading, not because she's taken that guy's consciousness hostage. This movie does not care about that, which we're not going to discuss in this video because yikes. But suffice it to say, I don't believe the wishes in this movie worked, so I'm overhauling that. Those are my big two changes. No Steve Trevor, and a Dreamstone that works differently. One that reveals specific things about our characters and connects to the larger themes in the film. So, without further ado, I hope you enjoy my rewrite of Wonder Woman 1984. And so, where do we begin? Act 1. We need to set up the ordinary world and Diana's lie and then end Act 1 with Diana accepting the call to adventure. Start the movie with the Maxwell Lord infomercial, maybe give us a little more backstory, but then we're straight into the mall. Diana foils a robbery. But, first big change, the crowd doesn't really appreciate her. 
not necessarily everyone, but Diana accidentally damages a few shops, stopping the robbers, and the people that run those shops get angry at Diana. Because the 80s kinda sucked. Wonder Woman 1984 doesn't have much interest in exploring this idea, but the 80s weren't all breakdancing in parachute pants. The values of greed and excess ruled over everything, and yeah, Lord definitely embodies those things in the original movie, but I want to turn that up to 11. People are selfish. They are mad that Diana harmed their precious mall. And Diana is down. So now we're setting up a crucial part of a character arc, the lie. The wrong thing that Diana believes which will drive some bad decisions. Diana is not sure if man's world is savable. The values on display in the 80s have really hurt Diana's spirit, and she's become kind of hopeless? And I think this lie fits in nicely with the Diana coming into a sequel. She knows why she left the mascara in the first movie, to save the world from war. And she kinda did that, World War I for sure, probably showed up there in World War II. And we've got the Cold War and conflicts in the Middle East now, but they're a lot more messy, not nearly as clear when it comes to heroes and villains. So Diana is not sure how to inspire people in the 1980s. She does her best by using her abilities to save people, but it doesn't make a huge difference. People are not getting better, and Diana is upset. She goes back to work. Another change, uh, Diana should run an archaeological consulting agency. I understand what they were going for with the Smithsonian angle, but it just doesn't feel like the most interesting place for Diana at this point in her story. And other people have pointed this out, but it's weird to connect her to a high-profile government agency like the Smithsonian. Especially if she doesn't age. In this version, Diana wants to do good, and she chooses to do that largely on her own. Although she does have a secretary. Now, I understand that Etta Candy would be either dead or pretty old, so why not introduce her granddaughter, Erica Candy? She's your typical 80s kid, and she works as Diana's assistant. So Diana's day job is as an archaeological consultant for a company she runs called Prince Archaeology. She sees this as a good way to both use her knowledge of the ancient world and protect humanity from potentially dangerous objects. They usually end up in the Smithsonian, which Prince Archaeology does have a friendly relationship with, although they deal mostly with Erica and other assistants, so Diana is able to work in relative secrecy. But the last few years have been tough. Cuts to the Smithsonian's budget have left Diana with less and less work. So not only is Diana having trouble making ends meet, she's kind of bored. And I want this part of the movie, the first act, to have a Ghostbusters vibe. Our hero is having less trouble dealing with the supernatural and more trouble just managing a small business. Maybe we also show Diana on a date with someone who turns out to be a real scummy 80s type, just to reinforce that Diana doesn't feel at home here. And this leads us to the next important part of Act 1, the call to adventure. So Diana walks into the office and notices Erica chatting with someone, almost starstruck. Diana continues into the office and is shocked to find Maxwell Lord, the guy from TV. He's handsome, well-dressed, and genuinely charming. Lord sees Diana. Ah, the Diana Prince. I hope you don't mind, I don't have an appointment. Erica says, oh, it's okay, we don't have anything on the schedule today. Or this week, Diana gives Erica a look. Listen, I'm sorry you came all this way, Mr. Lord, but I'm actually pretty busy today. If you speak to Erica, I'm sure she can schedule some time in the next few weeks. Diana is not having it. She does not trust guys like Lord and does not want anything to do with them. I'm sorry, Miss Prince, if I intruded. Diana, what are you doing? No, no, it's all right. I was in the neighborhood, figured I'd stop by. I can make a formal appointment. Lord begins to walk away. Erica says, Diana? Diana says, I know men like this. We're not working with a slime ball like Lord. But he's got money. You should hear him out. His dig sounds cool. Diana says, a dig? Yes, Miss Prince, a dig. Please, I understand your concerns. I'm sure you've worked with more than enough men who look like me to know what's wrong with us. And I may look like them, but this is just to fit into that world. I'm not like them. I serve a higher purpose. And what's that? History, Miss Prince. Just listen to my offer. If nothing else, I think you'll find the legend entertaining. Fine. Cut to Max in a meeting room with the projector and a set of transparency papers. The Materiopticon, also known as the Dreamstone, a legendary gem constructed by the great forces of creation known only as the Endless, imbued with the power to reshape reality. 
Legend has it that the wielder of the Dreamstone can use the stone's power to grant any wish. I know, fairy tales, but still, a priceless artifact that was, until very recently, lost to time. Recently? Yes, I've been working with another archaeologist who believes she has found the location of the Dreamstone, and I want to lead a small expedition to recover it. And no offense, but what do you want me for? Well, I want you to help recover the stone. Prince Archaeology's reputation precedes you. What's the catch? <sighs> There's a short window of opportunity, I'm afraid. We're not the only ones after the stone. My former business partner, Simon Stagg, has his own team that is going to be attempting to excavate the stone in the next few weeks. Why not now? Well, the archaeologist he hired is busy until the end of the month, in Egypt, I believe. Oh, no. Rex Mason? You've heard of him. Unfortunately. We've met. He's... something. Yes, well, Simon has a lot of confidence in Rex, and once Rex is free, they're heading down to South America to excavate the stone. South America? I thought the stone was lost in Rome. Yeah, that's what we initially thought, but new research suggests that the Dreamstone was actually discovered by the Mayans shortly before their civilization fell, which is why there's almost no record of it. And what's stopping me from going and getting the stone myself? Oh, please, be my guest. Although, travel and navigating the terrain and bribing local governments and securing equipment are expensive. And I don't believe you can afford that on your own, just a hunch. And by the end of the month, Mason and Stag will have the stone anyway. All I'm asking is that you work for me. I will bankroll the entire expedition, and like I said, the money is good. You won't need to take another dig you don't want for decades. I'll even let you take whatever else you find in the temple. All I ask is you leave the stone for me. Hell, I'll even throw in a wish. For free. It's tempting, Mr. Lord. Please, Max. Max. I don't know if we're interested. Think about it. I'm leaving in 48 hours. Here's hoping I see you there. Max leaves a plane ticket with Diana and Erica. Diana and Erica talk. Erica thinks it's a great idea. The money will keep them open forever. But Diana's not sure it's worth it. She goes home and sleeps on it. So that's your call to adventure. Max's expedition to find the Dreamstone. And Diana's cynicism has led her to reject the call. Cynicism brought on by the lie. That man's world is beyond saving. And she may not be wrong for rejecting the call. But she's kind of rejecting it for the wrong reasons. Next day, Diana goes to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, takes a look at some old exhibits about World War I planes. She takes a walk down to Pershing Park and eats some lunch. Let's make it a gyro for fun. Diana talks to herself, kind of, asks Steve what she should do. Is this money worth working for someone like Lord? What's she even here to do anymore? And then, a woman walks up to Diana, a redhead dressed like a proper explorer. She addresses Diana. Miss Prince? Uh, hello, how do I know you? My name is Barbara. Dr. Barbara Minerva. Nice to meet you, but I'm confused. Of course, he must not have told you I was coming. Lord? Yes, Mr. Lord told me to come see you, to talk. Of course he did. I'm sorry, I thought you knew. I don't want to impose. No, it's fine. How did you find me? Your assistant said you usually eat lunch here. It's a beautiful memorial. Do you know someone who fought in the war? Sort of. So you're an archaeologist, the one who found the Dreamstone. I'm a lot of things. Archaeologist, gemologist, Egyptologist, and yes, hopefully, the woman who found the Dreamstone. So you think it's real? Real like it can grant wishes? I doubt it. But the stone is something, something very valuable. Entire civilizations fought over it. So, I think whatever it ends up being will be worth learning more about. Fair enough. Listen, Diana, I asked for you to join the expedition. I don't know you personally, but Prince Archaeology has been able to accomplish some amazing things. I want someone who I know cares about the work while I'm there. What about Lord? Oh, him? I've known a million Maxwell Lords. He's harmless. Well, okay, harmless isn't the right word, but... Lord's another rich snob who wants a fancy piece for their collection and is willing to pay an insane amount of money to get it. We need people like that to fund these projects. So you hold your nose for a few weeks and then you're done. And honestly, out of all the Maxwell Lords I've worked with, 
This one is on the less skeevy side. Why do you think Lord wants the stone so badly? I'm 50-50 on that one. I think it's either because he thinks it has actual magical powers, or he only wants it because his ex-business partner wants it. And what do you think? About? The Dreamstone. Do you believe the legends? I mean, I don't not believe them. Really, it doesn't make a difference to me. If the legend is what it takes to get a couple of multi-millionaires to pay me to find it, then sure, why not? I'm sure Lord told you who we're up against. Mason. Yeah, he's a real piece of work. So, on top of all that, I really want to scoop Rex Mason. Take this find away from him. I know Max wouldn't say it, but we need you on this one. The rest of the crew is fine, but they're inexperienced. I need someone who knows their way around an ancient ruin. And I think you're the one. I'll think about it. Plus, if the legends are true, you get to make a wish. There's got to be something you really want. Anyway, that's the pitch. Lord said he gave you the ticket. I hope to see you tomorrow. And Barbara leaves. Our first introduction to Barbara paints a very different character to the one from Wonder Woman 1984. This Barbara is more confident, more comfortable working in this world than Diana. And as much as I don't mind the nerd gets magic superpowers and turns into a cool villain trope, I don't think it makes for a particularly compelling antagonist. Those characters, your Catwoman, your Riddlers, your Poison Ivies, your Electros, your Killians, they aren't really that interesting. It's usually pretty shallow. I find Cheetah a much more interesting character if she seems like she has it all together and then loses it. Then I think her descent into villainy will make more sense. And as for casting, I don't think this version really gels with a Kristen Wiig type performance. Act 2 is going to draw inspiration from your Indiana Jones and, more recently, your mummies. So I think someone like Marion Ravenwood or Evie O'Connell fits a little better here. Intelligent, capable, confident, maybe not as good of a hand-to-hand -hand fighter as her counterpart, but still capable. So for casting, Barbara is traditionally British and redhead. So why not stick with that? I think that characterization fits with the kind of adventure movie we're going for. Maybe someone like uh, Gemma Anterton, who's going to show up in The King's Man. I'm not super picky about casting, honestly. And in this conversation, we see that Barbara and Diana get along. Not just as friends, but as equals. And that's rare for Diana. Both incredibly driven archaeologists who are realistic about what they need to do to succeed. The big difference is... Barbara has already decided to work with Lord because she has something to prove. This is her discovery, and she is not going to let anyone take it from her, Rex Mason least of all. Diana just needs the money, but she could also use a vacation, and maybe this trip will renew her sense of adventure. So Diana goes home, and looks at some bills, worries about her company and her future. She looks out a window and asks her mother, Hippolyta, what she should do next. Even more than Steve... Diana misses the wisdom of the Amazons. It's been something like 60 years since Diana was home. Diana doesn't even know if her mother's still alive. And that gives Diana an idea. If the Wishing Stone is real, maybe Diana can use it to see her family one more time. So okay, Diana has now accepted the call to adventure. Act 1 ends with Diana meeting Maxwell Lord and Barbara Minerva at the airport and going with them to Belize. So Act 2. We are going to have some fun. In Wonder Woman 1984, the first half of Act 2 was everyone getting their wish granted, which meant this was when Diana and Steve spent time together. And look, is Chris Pine charming and fun to watch? Of course, he's terrific. But the idea of Steve Trevor coming back from the dead in the sequel, where his death inspired the main character to complete their character arc, hmm, hmm, I don't know, uh, it, uh, it, it reminds me of something. Something not good. And yeah, there's more to Wonder Woman 84's revival than Kingsman's unnecessary revival of Harry Hart. But bringing back Steve feels like a bad move for a couple of reasons. First, for this return to mean something, we probably need to spend more time away from Steve Trevor. Realistically, he has only been dead to us for one hour of movie time. This feels like a lot more of a third movie thing. But also... Steve takes up a lot of space in Wonder Woman 1984, space that should probably go to Diana and Barbara's relationship. This is supposed to be her arch enemy, and they work together once or twice and get dinner once. I wouldn't be shocked if Diana forgot Barbara's name when they met in the White House. 
we need more time with those characters. And third, it feels kind of strange that Wonder Woman, the feminist icon, spends the beginning of this movie wishing the man was back in her life. Like she can't be complete without him. It's a strange move is all I'm saying. So that's not what I want to do. I want a second act that's mostly Diana, Barbara, and Lord. They fly to Belize and get working on this dig. But, uh uh-oh, they're not alone. When they arrive at the site, there's already a crew there, run by Simon Stagg, Lord's former business partner. Diana said, You said we'd be alone. We were supposed to be alone. What's going on? Maxwell, I'm glad you could make it. What are you doing here, Simon? I thought you weren't able to start before the end of the month. Wait, if he's here, that means... And Rex Mason enters, wipes some sweat from his brow, picture a slightly more conceited Nathan Drake, handsome and full of himself. That's right, Maxie. Once I heard you were coming down, I got in the first plane out of Cairo. I figure those ruins aren't going anywhere. (laughs) I had no idea you'd be bringing THE Diana Prince and the lovely Miss Barbara Minerva with you. Doctor. Right, right. Well, this is just great, you know, you two chicks working together. I dig it. Feminism. I'm down. I read the books. Seen the paintings that look like flowers, but, uh, you know, I know what they are. Unfortunately, you're going to come up short. I've already got a head start on this thing, but at least you'll get to be there when I find the Dreamstone. Get to witness some real live history. I want this Rex Mason to be an absolute clown. A Gilderoy Lockhart type. Expecting everyone to faint at the sight of him. A lot like the Americans in The Mummy, all rolled into one guy. And he's the perfect antagonist for this bit of the movie. So I want four things to happen in Act 2. First, we need to see Barbara and Diana getting along. Just like making a joke or two together, and Diana warms up to Barbara. They can bond over their shared experiences as the only women in the field. But we're also going to see some differences between their characters. Most notably... Barbara is a self-made woman, came from nothing, no superpowers, no royalty, very much the opposite upbringing of Diana. Barbara has been forced to struggle. It makes her more relatable to us, and Diana likes that. She respects Barbara. Second, we need to demonstrate that Diana is good at this. She's not just coasting off of her knowledge of the ancient world. Diana is solving problems, finding secret doors, avoiding traps. And because she's working with Barbara, even though Diana is borderline invincible, the team's still in real danger. There are consequences here. Barbara could die. Third, we've got to have some fun with Rex Mason. For those of you who don't recognize the name, Rex Mason is the alter ego of a DC hero named Metamorpho, sometimes referred to as the Element Man. So, he's a good guy. And if he's popular here, definitely some room for a spinoff movie. And... While he's kind of a chauvinist jerk, he is not necessarily a villain. He's just kind of a Thor type, pre-worthiness. And in a future movie, he gets brought down to Earth and redeemed, so there's a future for this character as a more likable guy. He can grow. And here, Rex is in way over his head. He's more of an adventurer, and he's always a step behind Barbara and Diana when it comes to the actual archaeology part of the archaeological dig. Because they're just better at this than him. And four, this one's really important. Barbara is walking around, and the earth quakes a bit. You see, Stag is attempting to use explosives to open a chamber, because Rex can't figure it out, and one of the explosions loosens a large rock above Barbara. Diana notices and screams, get out of the way! But Barbara does not have time. She ducks down in fear, and Diana rushes in and catches the rock. Barbara is in shock. Diana is worried. She tosses the rock immediately in the other direction. Barbara says, You're... Diana interrupts. We need to go. It isn't safe here. Barbara knows something is up with Diana. They don't speak about it at the time, but Barbara is clearly curious. Now, my Act 2A descriptions always feel a little short, because this is where a lot of the action goes. Training montages, mini-boss, and here, the quest for the Dreamstone. But I can't describe it so you know just imagine five minutes of cool stuff anyway eventually they find a box containing the dreamstone they bring it out of the ruin simon and rex see the group outside simon gets angry and is ready to tear into the team but rex goes over and congratulates barbara and diana 
because he's not a bad guy, just kind of an idiot. And he knows he's going to be fine if he didn't find this thing. He's got plenty of other opportunities. Max, Diana, and Barbara take a jet home. Max is thrilled. Barbara's proud of herself. And Diana feels accomplished. She did something important. And she made a friend. This is great for her. They fly back to D.C. Lord tells the group that his people are going to look at the stone. He thanks Barbara and Diana and tells them that the money will be deposited in their accounts immediately. And he'll meet up with them soon to give them their wish. Barbara and Diana go get drinks. They're both having a great time. And Barbara says, So, you're going to tell me? Tell you what? That thing at the ruins when you caught that huge rock. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on. Don't do that to me. I was there. Diana thinks. And she kind of trusts Barbara. There's something very genuine about her. But Diana does not want to reveal the secrets of the Amazons. Barbara says, I know what it is. Remember, I study this kind of stuff. Diana says, oh, well, I guess you're, you're an alien, right? You got me. I knew it. What planet are you from? Uh, you've never heard of it. It's very far away. Are you the only one? As far as I know, there aren't any others like me, at least not here. Oh, wow. So you're like E.T.? Um, the movie. Phone home. Oh, right. Something like that. I'm sorry. Must be lonely. Eh, I'm used to it. Next, Diana talks to Lord, who shows up at her office with the Dreamstone. He's wearing it on a necklace. Diana! Mr. Lord, is that the Dreamstone? I had my team check it for things like radiation. It's completely safe. It's pretty dope. I'm saying that right, right? Technically, yes, but also no. I can live with that. Anyway, Diana, I wanted to come and thank you again. And also give you a chance to make a wish. That's all right, Mr. Lord. I told you, Max. Max, I don't think so. Oh, come on. Humor me. Plus, if it doesn't grant your wish, what's the harm? There has to be something you really want. <sighs> Fine. Max takes Diana's hand, holding the Dreamstone in his own. She closes her eyes and then opens it. Well, all right then. I hope you got what you're looking for. If I have another expedition, I will be sure to give you a call. Max leaves. Diana goes about her day. You can tell she's a little anxious. Keeps like looking around, waiting for something to happen. Secretly hoping that her wish was actually granted. But nothing so far. Then Max meets with Barbara. Same story, except Barbara goes for it. She is bought into the magic of the Dreamstone. She also makes a wish, although we don't know what it is yet. That night, Diana goes home. And when she walks into her apartment, she sees something on the table. Something that wasn't there before. Diana walks towards the table, and it becomes clear. It's a mirror. A small handheld mirror. Maybe even a compact. Diana is confused. She examines the mirror, but there doesn't seem to be anything special about it. But then, Diana notices something strange about the reflection in the mirror. Diana is confused. She holds the mirror up to her face and tries to look into it. And when she does, it glows. Diana is scared and drops the mirror on the floor. And when she picks the mirror up, Diana sees something shocking. It's Hippolyta, her mother. Diana begins to cry. Her mother isn't doing anything special, just sitting there in a chair looking out at the mascara. And it really makes Diana miss her home. She hoped seeing Themyscira would make her feel better, cure her homesickness, but this only makes it worse. And that is the midpoint of the movie. All of the main characters got what they think they want. Diana gets to see her home, Barbara gets what will eventually be revealed to be superpowers, and Lord gets the Dreamstone. Now we're going to see how getting what they want changes our main characters. In a wish movie, usually, the lesson is, what you want isn't what you need. Diana wants to see her home on Themyscira. Barbara wants to be as powerful as Diana, but that is not what either really needs. So this is where we're going to really start moving. Max is making power plays. He has meetings with businessmen, celebrities, senators, giving all of them the same pitch. Maybe we'd even see it as a montage. Every time we cut away from Max, he's talking to someone new. 
and Max ends the speech the same way for everyone. Tell me, what are your wildest dreams? Max holds their hands and holds the stone. They don't know that the stone is even part of the equation. And they all think it's so stupid, but like they go with it, right? One asks for money, one asks for women, one asks for youth. Max says, granted, to each, and leaves with a smile on his face. Next, we see Barbara going to the gym, working out, getting her super generic powers. And one night, Barbara sees a woman getting mugged. It reminds her of how helpless she was before Diana saved her. And Barbara helps this woman, beats up the mugger a lot. And this is not treated as a moral failing, like it kind of is in Wonder Woman 84. There's no judgment. Barbara is just a plain old hero, and she feels great. Also, she's wearing cheetah print, so when the woman who saved her tells the story, the papers call her mysterious rescuer, the cheetah. Barbara and Diana go out for drinks. Barbara's feeling great. Diana is not. She tells Barbara that she got a look at her home, but it didn't help her homesickness. Barbara asks if Diana has tried going home. And Diana explains that it's, it's impossible. Barbara tells Diana that Max might be able to help. Meanwhile, Max is in his office with a subordinate. The subordinate tells Max that calls have been coming in all day thanking Max for wishes. Max is intrigued. He asks if a certain senator that we saw earlier has called. The underling says, actually, he's been waiting on the line all day. Max is intrigued. He picks up a phone. Hello, Mr. Senator. Yes, yes, I can make the wish last longer, but I need something in return. I'm meeting with the president. The senator says, done. And Max leaves the office, and as he's leaving, the underling asks, So, what did you wish for? Max says, I didn't wish for anything. Nothing? I thought you wanted power. I don't want to be the one with power. Puts a target on your back. Things get messy. All I want is for the people in power to owe me a favor. Now, we get more Diana. Fighting crime, trying to inspire people. Also, this is like a little thing, but let's have Diana fighting crimes reminiscent of movies from the 80s. As if they are kind of real. Like, maybe one of the bad guys looks like Red Foreman in Robocop. Or maybe the terrorist in the mall looks like Hans Gruber. And every time, Diana does not get the recognition she thinks she deserves. And as she is stopping one crime, a Terminator-style villain, not necessarily a robot from the future, but just someone that looks like the Terminator who has a minigun, she is joined by the mysterious Cheetah, and the two of them take down this villain together. During the fight, they both notice each other. It's especially obvious to Barbara, since she knows Diana has abilities. Barbara says, Diana? And Diana says, Barbara? We also see Max watching the whole thing on TV, and since he's seen the two women together, he figures it out instantly. We can also use the fight to demonstrate their differences. Cheetah is fast and nimble, Diana is strong and can kind of fly. And near the end of the fight, Cheetah becomes a little weaker, loses her powers a bit. Diana saves her. But overall, they beat this terminator guy. Max sees this and gets an idea. Diana says that she and Barbara need to talk. So they change into their street clothes. Barbara wears her glasses so no one recognizes her. And Diana asks Barbara, what happened? Where'd you get these powers? Barbara doesn't want to tell Diana that she got it from the wish, so she just says something must have happened on the dig. And this is where we get our philosophical talk. Diana is having serious doubts about the hero thing. Barbara is new and excited. Diana can't find a reason to keep fighting. She has not changed the world. She does not seem to be the symbol Steve hoped she could be. Barbara mentions that she wouldn't be doing what she's doing without Diana, but Diana shrugs it off. Now, it seems like you're the only one. Diana needs to go, so she leaves Barbara, who gets a call from Lord. She goes to meet him in his office, and yes, she gets a call on a humongous cell phone. Lord hugs Barbara. The Dr. Barbara Minerva. Or should I say, the cheetah. I don't know what you're talking about. No, 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 of course not. There must be another stunning redhead leaping around DC who just happened to show up after you made your wish for, I guess, cat-like reflexes? Is it that obvious? Only to me. No one else knows about the Dreamstone, so they can't put it together. I think your secret's safe. Thank God. Is that why you wanted to see me? Sort of. I could tell that your powers were failing. From what I understand, the Stone's wishes aren't permanent. 
Not unless there's some sort of, uh, exchange. Exchange? Yeah, if you do a favor for me, the wish lasts longer. I'm just figuring this stuff out, too. It must be part of the wish logic. What do you need from me? It's uh, nothing, really. Um, could you set up a meeting between myself and Miss Prince? Put in a good word? I know she isn't my biggest fan, but she'll listen to you. Oh, of, of course, but I don't think she's interested. It isn't like that. Just a business arrangement. I think you know why this requires complete discretion. Wink. Ah, I'll see what I can do. Perfect. Then your wish is granted. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Please, Max, don't mention it. Tell Diana I'm free later tonight if she is. So we check in with Diana. She's at home. She picks up the mirror and begins to look into it. But as she's checking up on her friends, she notices that the mirror becomes cloudy and Diana can no longer see her home. She cries. Big emotional moment. And now, Diana's even more depressed than before. She had a small piece of home, and now it's gone. And just then, Barbara calls Diana. Diana tries to hide her tears. What, what, what do you mean he wants to meet with me? I'm not sure, but I think he also might know your secret. I didn't say anything, but trust me, I think he wants to help. It's just one meeting. Okay, fine. Diana goes to Max Olord, meets him for dinner at a fancy restaurant. Miss Prince, thank you so much for coming. What is this about? Please, enjoy yourself. This restaurant is one of the best in the city. The head chef used to run the kitchen at the White House. I'm only here because Barbara asked me to come. Of course, Dr. Minerva. She's truly extraordinary. I think you know what I mean. I'm sure I don't. Well, I don't know what it is, but I'm good at reading people. And you have a secret, a big one. Mr. Lord, I don't want to pry. I apologize, but that isn't all. You're also... Lonely. You're missing something. Is that what you wished for? A long lost love? No, it was home. I wished to see my home. I assume it's difficult to get there? Diana nods. Because it's... Lord gestures upwards. No, no, I'm from Earth. Oh, thank goodness. Then I think I can help you. What do you mean? Well, I have access to a prototype jet. It's self-flying and completely invisible to radar. It can take you wherever you need to go. If you want. <laughs> You're joking. No. I have powerful friends. They can make this happen. And you won't need to worry about exposing anyone. The jet is untraceable. Why are you doing this? Because Barbara is a friend. And this seems important to her. I can help her by helping you. But uh, there is one catch. Which is... The jet will need to return to DC very expensive. So, once you're dropped wherever you go, you might be stuck there, Diana thinks. And you need to make your decision quickly. I don't want to rush you, but the carriage is going to turn into a pumpkin at week's end. It's getting dismantled. So, you'll need to leave in the next 24 hours, give or take? I'm sorry it's so sudden, but this is the best I could do. This may be your last opportunity to go home. For a long time. Diana gets up. I, I need to think. I will contact you soon. And, um, Mr. Lord? Yes? Thank you. Of course, Miss Prince. Diana goes for a walk. She thinks about everything. Her family. Steve. Barbara. She feels so alone. Maybe this experiment on man's world is over, and Diana needs to return and be with her own kind. But what about this world? And then Diana sees a news report. People talking about the cheetah. Hailing her as their new protector. And Diana thinks she may be able to leave everything in Barbara's hands. Barbara is capable and a good person. Maybe the world doesn't need Diana anymore. So Diana calls Lord and says she's in. He asks her to meet him at the Smithsonian. She also says that her wish is running out and she needs it to complete the trip. So whatever he did, if he can make it work again. He says that won't be a problem. I'll see you in the morning. Diana goes to sleep and thinks about Steve, their time together, and his sacrifice. She thinks about the years she's lived since his death, and how little she believes she has been able to do. Didn't stop any wars, disasters. She feels helpless. Diana wakes up the next day, packs a bag, calls Erica, 
tells her that she's closing down the agency for a bit and has set up a fund for Erica to spend on college and other expenses. Diana meets Lord at the Smithsonian. He shows her her new plane. It's a stealth plane covered in reflective panels. Diana says, This will get me wherever I want to go. Lord, anywhere on Earth. You are going somewhere on Earth, right? Yes. Then this will get you there. You can fly it yourself or just punch in coordinates and the jet will do the rest. Oh, thank you, Mr. Lord. Tell Barbara I'm sorry. You haven't told her? No, I couldn't. I'll let her know. Godspeed, Diana Prince. Diana gets into the jet and takes off from Themyscira. Lord turns his attention to the White House. He walks into the Oval Office and is greeted by the President. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. President. Of course. O'Fallon was pretty insistent you had something important to tell me. Indeed. I have a question. What do you wish for? Excuse me? I have everything in the world. What do you wish for? Well, peace. There is so much war. The Bialya-Markovia conflict is all anyone's talking about, and I can't do anything to help. Lord holds out his hand. May I? The president takes it. Imagine it. In your head. No war. All of the people. Living life in peace. Wish for your better world. Lord holds the stone in his other hand. Cut to Diana on the plane, dreaming about her new life, about seeing her mother and her friends. And she is awoken by an alarm. The plane cuts through some clouds and passes through this force field. Kind of like what happens when you re-enter Wakanda. Diana looks out the window, and she can see Themyscira. It's everything she remembers. A paradise. The plane lands on the shore and Diana steps out. She picks up a handful of sand and smells it. She's home. The jet flies away. A party of Amazons rides up to investigate the intruder and finds Diana. They're shocked. The party's leader, Artemis, jumps off her horse. Diana? Artemis! She runs over, gives Diana a hug. Everyone is stunned. We need to take you to the queen at once. Diana goes with the Amazons through the city. She sees many of her old friends and they're all awestruck. They drop what they're carrying to wave at Diana. The princess has returned, they all say. An Amazon runs into Hippolyta's chamber. Your Highness, she says. Hippolyta runs outside and sees Diana. She breaks down in tears. Diana runs up the steps to her mother and they hug. Cut to Lord and Barbara, having lunch at a restaurant on the Potomac. Barbara says, I can't believe she left. I know she wasn't happy here. I don't think she ever belonged. I'm sorry. I know she was important to you. It's fine. I hope she's happy. How did you get her on a rocket so quickly? I don't think she was actually an alien. Oh, so stupid. No, Barbara, you're brilliant. How have your powers been holding up? They're amazing. I stopped a robbery the other day. Some kind of demon? Experiment, maybe? At a McDonald's. Looked like E.T., but worse. That's excellent. Lord gets a call. I'm so sorry, Barbara. Something has come up. I need to leave. More wishes to Grant? Mm, something like that. Max exits the restaurant and gets in a limousine. He rides to the Smithsonian and meets with a scientist. What do you know? The Brother Eye program you had us install was able to get a lot of information, although it gets fuzzy near the end. She went to an island somewhere in the Mediterranean. Sort of. Sort of? Yeah, the island does not appear on any of our maps, and our satellites couldn't see it. But we do have some footage from the jet. Scientist plays the footage. You can see it cross through some sort of barrier. When it comes out on the other side, an island is clearly visible. And then the footage goes dark. Fascinating. And you weren't able to find anything else. We did get some footage from the island. It's full of ancient Greek architecture, but modern. And get this, from what tiny images we saw, there were no men at all. What do you mean? I don't know, but there don't seem to be any men on this island. Just these women. They're extraordinary. Here, you can see some of them training. For what? I'm not sure. Combat? I fear you're right. Send this information to my office. Max looks over to TV playing the news in the background. Reporter says, the peace talks that suddenly began between Bialya and Markovia have been stymied today by a disagreement on borders. 
Onlookers say it came out of nowhere, and these new developments have led to further escalation between the two nations. And up next, President Wilson's approval ratings took a sharp dive after news of the renewed tensions in the Middle East. Can he recover? Max gets a call. Right on cue. He answers it. Hello, Mr. President. What a nice surprise. Cut to Diana sitting with Artemis and Hippolyta. Diana says, So, have things changed since I left? Hippolyta says, Themyscira is thriving. New wildlife is growing, and we have a fresh crop of fighters. You should see them. Like Donna, I would swear she is your double. They've started calling her Wonder Girl. Then Hippolyta asks, Why are you here, Diana? I spent so much time in man's world. I fell in love, defeated Ares. But once that ended, I... It all continued. Man's world is filled with war and violence. Ares helped them, but it was their own nature. And I tried, but I couldn't stop it. The wars only became worse, more devastating, more cruel. And I guess I couldn't stand the fact that nothing I could do would change anything. I'd failed. So I came back here, where I belong. Oh, Diana. You always held such a weight on your shoulders, but that was never your burden. I always believed that you would be a light that could inspire them, that you were destined to change the world, and I still believe it, but I realize I was wrong. What? I should not have put that pressure onto you. It's not your responsibility to win every war or inspire every person. As long as you change one life, you're making a difference. This is what you were born to do. I don't know if I even did that. You're too hard on yourself. I'm sure there were so many people who loved you, whose lives you changed. Even here, so many of our sisters were inspired by your journey to follow your heart. Well, then I can do that here too. Train the next generation of warriors. I'm sorry, Diana, but that can't happen. Everyone is shocked. What do you mean? When you left, I told you you could never return. And my word as queen is paramount. But I came all this way. This is my home. You made a choice a long time ago. The right choice. You must live with the sacrifice, and so must I. Do you not want me here? Of course I do. You are my daughter. You have no idea how difficult this is, but I have a duty to the people. To uphold the laws even at my own cost. We'll find somewhere for you to stay until we can figure out how to get you off the island. I'm sorry. Artemis leads Diana out of the palace. Come, you can stay with me. Diana tearfully leaves her mother. Check back on Lord, who is back at the White House. Mr. President, I don't know how you did it, Max, but I need you to fix the peace talks. Of course, sir, but, um, it's complicated. I know you won't believe this, but the peace actually came from the wish you made. I have the power to grant wishes. Like I said, I don't care, I just need it fixed. That's the complicated part. For the wish to hold, I need you to sacrifice something for me. I know, I know. That's just how the power works. And the more significant the favor, the longer the wish lasts. What do you want from me? There is an island. Sort of. And I need you to destroy it. Sort of. Off the books. It won't cause you any political trouble. As far as everyone is concerned, it doesn't exist. You're asking for a nuke. You have several. I just need one. I can't authorize that. Pressure from the Russians, it's, it's too much. Lord gets ready to leave. Oh well, it was worth a try. But, Lord smiles, there is a facility. Also off the books in international waters, staffed by a small crew. It has one warhead, but it's heavily guarded and I cannot get you clearance. However, if you took control of the island that no one knows exists, by force, and launched your nuke, which no one knows exists, no one would find out but me. I can give you the coordinates and the launch codes, but that's it. That's more than enough, Mr. President. I admire your commitment to peace. You sure you can take down those guards? They're highly trained. Now don't worry. I have a friend who owes me a favor. Check back on Diana, who is sulking in Artemis' house. 
And it makes sense. This is her dark night of the soul. She no longer feels needed in man's world. And she's no longer welcome on Themyscira. Diana doesn't know where to go or what to do. Artemis comes in the house and sits with Diana. Althea is working on a way to get you back. Should have it taken care of by nightfall. I think she's stalling to give you more time. It's always it. More time. Well, I've had 65 years and nothing to show for it. My only friend is dead of old age and my lover died within weeks of my arrival. The pilot? Yeah, the pilot. Why did he die? He sacrificed himself to destroy a bomb. Not how, why. Was it his duty? Somewhat. But Steve loved man's world. Truly. He showed me so much. The dancing. The food. It was good? <laughs> no. Dreadful compared to what we have here. Although there was something called ice cream that was splendid. But the whole thing had a certain charm. It's difficult to put into words. But the flaws made man's world beautiful. All of Steve's friends were thieves and scoundrels, but there was always something there, something unique. And the fun was finding it, laughing with them, crying. Underneath it all, the imperfections, the truth, that was worth it. I think I may have forgotten that, that everything doesn't need to be perfect, that I need to look deeper. And just then, Diana's bag begins to shine. Artemis draws her sword and asks, what is that? Diana says, it's a mirror. Enchanted, it's showing me a museum? What is this enchantment? I thought it showed me my mother, but maybe it's just... Diana walks into frame. Who I care about? Artemis asks, who is she? Dr. Barbara Minerva, a friend. Barbara walks up to Maxwell Lord. Can you hear what they're saying? I can read lips. Barbara hugs Max. What's wrong with me, Max? My powers, they're completely gone. That's why I asked you to meet me here. For your wish to last, you need to do me a favor. The bigger your favor, the longer the wish lasts. I have something that can give you your powers forever. What do I need to do? I need you to help me take over an island. There's a small army guarding it, and you want me to... If you can take the island without it, it's fine. But if it comes down to it, I may need you to kill. Diana's concerned. She says, no, Barbara. Barbara asks, what's on the island? A missile. The details are not important, but I learned of a dangerous place that needs to be destroyed. Trust me, the world will be better for it. Okay, I'll go, but I'm going to need more power. Max says, done. Diana gets worried. I need to stop them. He's using her. He's going to make her do something terrible. What do you think he's going to do? He said he wants to destroy something. Powerful. Oh no. He's talking about Themyscira. How does he know about us? I used his plane to get here. He must have been tracking me. We need to warn the rest of the Amazons. There isn't anything they can do here. I need to go back and stop him myself. We need to get to Althea. Diana and Artemis get on their horses and ride to Althea. As she's riding, Artemis shoots a single arrow into the distance. It lands right above Hippolyta, and a scroll unfurls from the arrow. Diana and Artemis make it to Althea's lab. Diana, I didn't think I'd see you for a while. Althea, I need to get back to man's world. I know, it will be done soon. Maybe tomorrow? I can't wait that long. We need it now. Okay, uh, it's finished. What? I finished it earlier today. It's a prototype I've been working on based off of your boyfriend's crashed vehicle. Mine is better, of course. Can it fly? Regular planes fly. Mine soars through the air like an eagle on the hunt. That's perfect. We need to get in it now. I need to stay here. The Amazons need me. But Artemis, you can help. I am needed here. I will work with Althea to try to figure out a way to save the others if your plan fails. Well, you can leave now. Donna is fueling it up and the field is out back. Wait a second, what are you saving us from? Thank you. The three Amazons run out and see the proper invisible jet. Incredible. Now go, Diana. I will. I wish I could say goodbye to... And she sees... Paulta. Your mother? Diana, we need to stop meeting like this. Diana says, I need to go to protect the island and my friend. Artemis can explain. Diana hugs her mom. I understand. You have someone to protect. I'm glad. The good inside of one person is stronger than all of the evil in this world. You need to share it. Show the people that there is another way. I've always believed in you. Now go. Diana gets in the invisible jet, flies away, taking one last look at Themyscira, 
And that's the end of Act Two. Diana is booking it back to the island, which let's say is far off the coast of Maryland. She knows what matters to her now, saving her family, but also her friend, Barbara. Meanwhile, we see the secret facility that houses this nuke. A small army is standing guard, and they hear a sound, quiet, rustling. One goes searching and disappears into the darkness. Then everyone gets picked off one by one. This is our proper cheetah intro. And I'm not doing art here, but I never liked the naked cheetah look. Let's give her a purple leotard, very 80s. And she can have yellow cheetah print fur, but I'd also prefer she keeps her red hair. I really dig those colors working together. Also, it's a great way to separate this from cats because really, you know, you can't top perfection. So Barbara takes out all the guards in stunning cheetah fashion. None are dead necessarily, but they're all down for the count. And Maxwell Lord enters the island from a speedboat. Looks around, not bad. And they seem to be mostly alive, good for you. Am I finished? I just need you to guard the door. Do not let anyone through under any circumstances. You got it? I got it. None. None. Very good. Lord enters the facility, walks up to a computer terminal, and enters the coordinates for Themyscira. Cut back to Artemis and Nubia trying to get the Amazons to a safe place underground. Diana stops the plane in midair and jumps out. By the way, this is not the invisible jet from the cartoons where you can see the person inside it. It's just a cloaked jet. I think that's worth mentioning. Diana lands on the ground and finds the beaten soldiers. Some have scratched uniforms. No. Then, Barbara appears from the shadows, casually walking out. Diana. Barbara, you need to stop this now. He's using you. If I don't work with Max, I lose my powers, and I won't be able to help anyone anymore. Big deal if he destroys some island. That island is... It's where my people live. So that's where you ran off to. Get away from us nobodies. I'm sorry, Barbara. I did not value your friendship. But now we need to stop Lord. And what? Everything goes back to normal? I'm your weak and helpless friend? Not anymore. Sorry, Diana. But this is how it has to be. Cheetah bears her claws. Don't do this. Diana rushes for the compound, but Barbara blocks her. We get the big Wonder Woman vs. Cheetah fight. We have to make sure to show off the differences here. Wonder Woman, power, Cheetah, speed. Diana has tried to catch Cheetah with the lasso, but that isn't working. Cheetah is able to dodge and even use the lasso to pull Diana in. Oh yeah, and speaking of the lasso, not to nitpick, not unlike my podcast, mostly nitpicking, I think the lasso effect in all of the Wonder Woman movies is not great. My guess is they had Gal Gadot swing around her hands and just added the lasso in post. And I think that does not work. Like, I get, it's magic. But you've got to at least try to make it look like an actual physical object. Instead, it looks like a tendril, like something you'd find on Venom. It snaps out and then recoils back immediately. There's no length, no weight to it. Look at a movie that makes many of the same mistakes as Wonder Woman 1984, Kingsman, The Golden Circle. It's got a ton of problems, but that whip and lasso stuff is absolutely stellar. It's partially because they used a real whip and a real lasso. But even when they didn't, they kept a consistent length to the whip and the lasso. Small things like whiskey recoiling the whip go a long way. Anyway, while the fight is going on, we keep checking on Lord with the missile and Themyscira panicking and the missile launches. Eventually, Diana beats Barbara into submission, ties her up with the lasso. Diana then approaches Lord in the facility. We see Barbara struggling with some success to get out of the lasso. Lord behind the terminal says, I knew you were something special, but man, I never would have guessed Island of Warrior Women. Wow, you're a madman. Wrong, I'm a businessman. I see competition and I do what I need to destroy it. Your Wonder Women are the only power on Earth that rivals this. Holds up the Dreamstone. At that moment, Cheetah comes in and lassos Diana. Thank you, Dr. Minerva. That speech was getting a little wordy. Barbara, don't let him kill my family. He's the only person that's been there for me. He cares enough to stay. No, Barbara, I was wrong. I realized that. But I came back when I saw what he was doing to you. 
Then something clicks for Diana. In the mirror. Barbara says, what? Diana reaches for the mirror that's in her pocket or something and is able to toss it to near Barbara. This mirror is enchanted. It shows you what really matters, what you really care about. Barbara picks up the mirror and looks in. Diana says, originally I saw my family, but once I was on the island, I saw you, my friend. Barbara sees Diana in the mirror, but that image is overtaken by one of Lord. Barbara says, I see Max, because we care about each other. And Diana says, do you want to be sure? And Diana looks over at Max. Barbara understands and says, hey Max, what does this look like to you? She tosses the mirror over to Max, who catches it and looks in. He sees himself. What? It's just a mirror. I don't understand. Barbara gets angry. You, you'd never cared about me. You don't understand, Barbara. It isn't personal. It's just business. She begins to stalk towards Max. He says, I can make your dreams come true. I can give you anything you want. Barbara looks over at Diana and says, I already had it. And then Barbara knocks out Lord. He hits the ground, and Barbara frees Diana, who ties up Lord. Then they disarm the missile, and it falls safely into the ocean. I'm so sorry, Diana. I'm sorry. I left you, and he was able to take advantage of your kindness. Diana takes the dream stone into her hands. I need to do this, Barbara says. I know. Then Diana crushes the dream stone, releasing a wave of energy that nullifies all of the wishes. Barbara is lifted up into the air and transforms back into her normal self. She lands on the ground, dejected. Diana helps her up. Come with me. I have a jet outside. We can take Lord back to stand trial. I'm sure he broke some laws. Barbara says, I'm not going back with you. What? I liked that power, and I never wanted to get it from him, but I'm going to find a way to earn it back. I've heard some legends over the years. Never used to believe them, but now I'm willing to give them a chance. Diana says, I'll miss you. Barbara says, we'll see each other again someday. Maybe have a rematch, and I won't go easy on you. You were going easy on me. Oh yeah, I felt bad for you. You looked so sad. Well, I did just say goodbye to my family again, so you were full of excuses. They laugh and hug. Diana says, wait a minute. If you don't come with me, how are you getting off this island? Barbara says, well, Max came in a little boat. I'll take that. Call it a going away present. Max says, not the yacht. Diana says, I thought you said it was a little boat. I'll use the little boat to get to a slightly bigger boat. Goodbye, Barbara. Goodbye, Diana. Diana smiles, takes Lord back to the jet. As she flies away, she sees Barbara getting into Lord's huge yacht. It says, wish you were here on the back. Maybe here we play I Wish by Stevie Wonder. Songs in the Key of Life came out in 1976, so it's period appropriate. And also, Stevie Wonder's amazing, and I love that bass line. And we use this last bit to close everything up. No words, just a fun song. Max goes to trial, guilty of something. Then we see Barbara open up a bottle of champagne on the yacht and unfurl a map. She starts plotting a course and circles the fictional African nation of Burunda. We check in on the Amazons. They're all breathing a sigh of relief. Last thing, Diana starts the practice up again and Diana frames a picture of herself and Barbara from the dig. She hangs it next to the picture of her and Steve from World War I. Zoom in on the picture, end of movie. So that's my pitch. My biggest change, sorting out the wishes. The Dreamstone gave you what you thought you wanted at a price you thought was worth it. But in reality, you need something else and that's what you see in the mirror. The want and need are important elements of a character arc and in this movie, they're represented pretty clearly by physical objects. It's a little on the nose, but hey, what's so wrong with that? And stick around because I have an idea for a post credit scene after this brief message. I also have an idea for a sequel. It's a super simple idea that I think would be a lot of fun. And I talk about that idea a bit, as well as some possible spin-offs in an extended version of this video that you can find on Nebula. So if you're subscribed to Nebula, Go over there now. The link and time code are in the video description. For any of you guys who don't already know, Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service that I helped to create. 
and we partnered with CuriosityStream for a bundle that gets you a year of CuriosityStream's high-quality documentaries about everything from science to nature to history. There are so many different documentaries I've recommended over the years. Like, one of my new favorite series is called Face to Face, which examines the great feuds of history. Political ones, like between Castro and Che Guevara. Industrial ones, like between Airbus and Boeing. And then, the one that hit closest to home, Coke versus Pepsi. Truly the defining rivalry of the 20th century. If you don't believe me, watch the documentary and I think you'll get it. So if you want to get access to that bundle that includes Nebula and CuriosityStream, a yearly subscription is only $15 for the whole year, which not only helps to support us, your favorite creators, but it also means you don't need to watch sponsor reads and you get to see exclusive Nebula Plus content. Here's a little tease. Second, I would love an Amazon series, not on Amazon, on HBO, but like a series about the Amazons. Like it seems like we were getting, I'm not sure maybe we still are. Have the main character be Artemis, Diana's unofficial successor fighting off threats from without in the form of Nubia in the floating island and within as Cersei returns to take control of the island away from Hippolyta. The link is in the video description. It is curiositystream.com slash Nando. Go check it out. As always, I have to give a humongous thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon and to all of the new patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. You have no idea how much I appreciate the support. If you want to see your name up here, get access to videos early, be part of the book club, watch the live streams, all that stuff, patreon.com slash nandovmovies is where to do that. You have no idea how much I appreciate it and how helpful it is for the channel. Also, the podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, listen to that. Every week we pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. We do episodes about every big release that happens during the year. So next week's going to be Shang-Chi and then we're going to be doing other releases like, I don't know, Dune if that comes out this year, No Time to Die, Venom 2. You got so many great ones to look forward to. We are Nitpicking Pod on Twitter and the podcast again is called Mostly Nitpicking. Last thing as always, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, TikTok. I'm Nando V Movies on all of those platforms. Those are all good ways to keep up. And definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed yet and you're still listening because that means you you know you enjoy these videos and a lot of you guys do make it this far. And if you're not subscribed, you, you should think about subscribing and hitting the bell icon because you know YouTube doesn't tell you things unless you hit that button. That's all I got. Stay safe. And here's the post credit scene. So the very end. We're back on Themyscira with Althea. She sees Artemis, waves her down. Artemis asks, is everything all right? Althea says, I was just wondering if you know what happened to Donna. I feel like I haven't seen her around since... Oh, Hera. Then we cut to the hangar where Diana is keeping the invisible jet. And a hatch opens. The trunk. And out pops a black-haired girl in her early 20s. She stands up, dusts off some pita chips and walks out of the hangar. We got our first look at Donna Troy, and that is the end of the movie.